Hello, my name is Kirk McKenzie, the founder of Defend Rural America. Today I'm going to be talking about how rural Americans can reclaim their lands. And we'll talk about that in three parts. The first part will discuss the problems. Now these are based upon my observations of the past couple of years of visiting dozens of counties and multiple rural states to see what is actually occurring. First we'll start with water. In California, the Delta smelt listing has basically resulted in the breadbasket of the world being shut down. The water is being turned off. It's gone from 100% allocation to 80% to 60% to 40%. In 2013, that water allocation was reduced to 20 to 25 percent, and then later in the year, it was reduced to zero percent because 300 three-inch smelt, or about 10 pounds of fish, were discovered in the pumps. This resulted in the loss of 800,000 acre feet of water that flowed directly to the ocean instead of to agriculture. Enough water for 800,000 families, irrigation for 200,000 acres. 20 million tons of grapes, and thousands of jobs. As a result, San Joaquin Valley is turning into Death Valley. These are trees along the highway that I drove by. These trees are completely dead and completely dry. What I see is the destruction of the trees, complete entire orchards, businesses, jobs, property values, and food. Next, we'll talk about what I've been observing relative to dams. In the Klamath River Basin, there's a proposal to destroy four hydroelectric dams. This impacts nine counties over two states in an area that's larger than the state of Maryland. The destruction of the dams would destroy the reservoirs, the habitat, they would restore flooding and drought to the rivers, and they would destroy energy for 60,000 homes. The proposal has been put together by a group of so-called stakeholders, government agencies and special interest groups that predominantly don't live there, put together a management plan for this area called the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement. These stakeholders now seek a federal charter in order for them to take control. If they do, then they're going to be controlling this area by remote control. The local people don't matter, nor does local government. Here we observe the destruction of a dam called the Condit Dam. We see not only the release of the water, but of the built up sediments. The end result of the destruction of lakes, destruction of repairing habitat, the destruction of property values. This dam destruction is part of an overall campaign to destroy dams across the country. So far, more than 1,000 have been destroyed. This is a map being tracked by one special interest group. At the time, it was only 836. There is a very similar plan being hatched in the western part of Montana. It affects the western watershed, 11 counties, and involves the senior water rights. If the proposal goes through, which is called the Water Compact, similar to the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement, the water rights of the people in this entire area will now be subordinated to the Flathead Indians, who play a similar role to those played by the Crook tribe in the Siskiyou County in the Klamath River story. This is no small problem. This is existing de designated habitat in California highlighted in yellow. That land is already off limits. And likewise, here it is for Montana. We can see that most of the waterways in the western Montana have already been designated. Under the existing Clean Water Act authority, the authority of the federal government is limited to the areas in black. Under a proposed change to that, called the Clean Water Restoration Act Authority, the federal government had almost total control over all lands, including private property. This plan was hatched some time ago. 
This map was created in October 2006, prepared by or for Representative Oberstar by the Democratic staff on the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. Here is a similar situation taking place in Missouri and Arkansas. The area that's in dark is an area where the federal government wishes to assert control on behalf of the White River watershed. Now this is a very important situation because these are not western states. These states have supposedly full statehood. And we can see that statehood is not a total solution if the federal government still can take control through legislation. Jurisdiction is the key, and we'll talk more about that later. In terms of agriculture, here is an article in Sunset Magazine, June 2013. There's a plan to restore the buffalo, being free Roman bison. The plan here is to purchase 3 million acres of Montana land. So far, they've purchased 300,000 acres. That'll mean the shutdown of roads, the shutdown of communities, farmland, agriculture, all in the name of 250 buffalo. Now, in terms of our forests, the forests are being only allowed to grow and grow and grow without proper harvest. As a result, just like a backyard that's not mowed, the trees are becoming overly dense. They're getting to be five to ten times more trees per acre than there should be. The trees become thin, more sickly. They're fighting for water. They're fighting for sun. Branches and undergrowth begin to build up, creating a lot of fuel. Compare that to what a healthy forest looks like. More open, bigger trees. We have some blue sky. We don't just see canopy. And we don't see the buildup of fuel on the, on the forest floor. This is the condition that leads to a sustainable forest. What we see in this picture is actually a forest fire. And the reason it doesn't look like one is because the trees are far enough apart, there's not enough fuel, the fire just ran along the ground and after about 100 yards or so went out all by its own instead of leaping up into the trees and into canopies. Compare that to this. We're seeing more of these catastrophic fires that are due to the overly densified forest reaching temperatures in some cases of 2,000 degrees and sterilizing the soil up to depths of eight feet. The intensity is absolutely overwhelming and enough to generate their own weather and up to 200 miles per hour of the wind. This is another one in South Lake Tahoe. The consequences of these fires include the deaths here are the 19 hotshots that died near Prescott, Arizona. I was there at the time. Destruction of property. The absolute incineration of living animals. It's estimated that approximately three animals per acre, so a fire of a million acres would result in the death by incineration of three million animals. We're talking about chipmunks and squirrels, skunks, deer, bison, elk, and even those endangered species. What's left of these is forests that look like matchsticks that have been burned. Another consequence is that when the rains come, there's nothing to hold them back. We start to see serious slope erosion. It can be bad enough to create flooding and even kill lives and certainly damage tremendous amount of property as we have seen in Colorado, where the intensity of the flooding seen there was a result of the forest fires. All that sediment flows into the creeks, the rivers, the streams, creating massive violations of the Clean Water Act. It also pollutes our air quality and massive violations of the Clean Air Act. There's more and more dangerous particles of this smoke than there is that are man-created. These are the two and a half micron particles that get into your lungs and stay there. Furthermore, the overly densified forests suck up more water and they get to be so dense that the snow cannot fall to ground, so it evaporates before it melts and becomes water in the water table. The consequence in California is an estimated 1 to 2 million acre feet of water that don't reach agriculture or don't even reach the streams for endangered species simply because it never gets there. Here's what I observe relative to the recreation. Our public lands are being shut off. Whether you're a hiker, you're a camper, you enjoy fishing, off-roading, swimming, 
increasing our public lands, our national parks, our wilderness areas, our wetlands, our monuments, national grasslands, people are no longer welcome. In terms of energy, 40% of our nation's energy is in coal. There are 486 billion short tons of proven reserves. However, radical changes to the clean air standards have been made that are forcing coal plants to shut down. We have 1.44 trillion barrels of oil, more oil than the entire Middle East put together. Nonetheless, that oil production is being affected by listings for lizards, buffaloes, bugs, grass. Same thing with natural gas, where we have 2.7 quadrillion cubic feet. In terms of hydropower, we've already seen it's the cleanest, renewable, and cheapest energy source that we have being destroyed. In terms of nuclear, we have abundant supplies of uranium in this country. 40% of which are in the northern Arizona Strip, which is now being shut down due to the additional listings. In their place, we're being told that solar is the solution. Here is one such solar farm. Solar energy is about 10 times more expensive. It is absolutely inefficient. If the sun shines, you have energy. Nighttime, it doesn't. Clouds, it doesn't. It's on, it's off. It's very space consuming. It takes approximately 100 to 1,000 times more land to produce the same amount of energy as hydropower. And it clearly has an impact on open space, watershed and wetlands, habitat, and those bugs, lizards, and grass. And in fact, when they shut these down, there's a true contamination problem because of the materials that are in these panels and in the systems, the liquid, uh, create a nightmare. Also, wind farms are being promoted. And let's face it, wind farms are ugly. And they sit right there where we usually have our normal views, on the hillsides. All of a sudden, that's okay. And they kill eagles and other major birds. And they certainly have an impact on open space. In terms of mining, here is a suction dredge miner. These are much smaller and more environmentally friendly units that we've seen in our history books. These have a four to six inch pipe, brings it up in over a sluice box and drops it right back into the ocean, having removed the heavy metals like gold, but also things like mercury. Those are being illegally shut down. The conclusions that I reached is that we are in a crisis. Rural America is failing. In fact, rural America is being conquered. Habitat restoration sounds like a great thing, but in my direct observations, it is meaning and resulting in destruction, the exact opposite. It's having an impact on our health by reducing air, water, and food quality. It's creating more stress, health problems, and spousal, child, and elderly abuse because of the plumbing economies. It's creating more property damage more drug cartels and drugs production. As the forests are shut off to people, the drug lords are moving in. More substance abuse, more crime, and reduced firefighting ability. In terms of welfare, here I'm talking about economic welfare, not social welfare. Fewer jobs, closing businesses, declining county and budgets and services, less and more expensive energy, less access to and use of natural resources, and fewer children. Some 30% of the nation's counties now on the threshold of going bankrupt. In their place, we're getting printed money out of thin air, using being used for, quote, the social welfare, creating a state of dependence. In terms of the environment, increased forest densification and fires, and increased desertification, which we'll be talking about later, and the loss of all our forest, animals, habitat, water, and air quality, and fish hatcheries. In terms of recreation, more land closures, and less public access. And we're killing off animals and other species by the millions, by the tens of millions. Death by incineration. What a more cruel way could there be to kill an animal? 
or by being eaten alive in the case of the release of wolves and other predatory animals, or death by killing off the habitat, including the endangered species. What I see is the expulsion of humans, human activities, and human progress. There are two competing visions. Ours is believed in the American dream, individuals owning their own home and being economically independent. Their view is destruction. Ours is based on the Constitution. Theirs belief that it's being replaced. It's flexible. It can be whatever we want it to be. We believe in a democratically elected process based upon constituents. In theirs, it's anybody has a vote. The name is so-called stakeholders. We believe in free will. They believe in central planning, government versus governance, sovereignty versus dependence, and security versus disarmament. We're losing. The vision that this country was founded upon is dimming. What are, what some, are some, some of the primary, primary causes? causes? In a In word, word neo-environmentalism. Neo I'm, I'm not talking, talking here about, about environmentalists. environmentalists. I'm, I'm an environmentalist, environmentalist and, I and I don't really, really have a problem, problem with environmentalists. I want, I want to keep this to be a garden, garden of Eden. Of Eden. But, but the, the wanton, wanton destruction, destruction is coming, coming about, about because, because of what, what these, these overly, overly Aggressive, aggressive policies, policies that, are that are resulting, resulting in, in all, all this destruction, destruction clearly, clearly is against, against our interests. Interest. Neo-environmentalism is a political movement. It's simply cloaked in green. Or, as one of the founders of Greenpeace called it, the watermelons, green on the outside and red on the inside. Quote, the environmental movement promises to bring greater numbers into our orbit than the peace movement ever did. This is Carl Boyce, Moscow correspondent of a communist paper. We reject the idea of private property. Prince Philip, founder of the World Wildlife Fund. Neo-environmentalists are domestic terrorists. It's really a situation of neo-environmentalists versus environmentalists, and I think it's very important to understand this. When we say, all oh, those crazy environmentalists, we have defeating ourselves because this country believes in environmentalism and most of the people who live in rural America are environmentalists. They certainly don't go there for fame or for fortune. They go there because they like the quality of lifestyle. They like the open space. They like the healthy forests and the rivers and the streams and the access that they have. When we say the other side are environmentalists, we're saying we're not. That's a very corrosive thought for us to have. And we immediately begin to lose the debate. So let's identify these people as what they truly are, these radicals that are using the environmental movement for political purposes, the neo-environmentalists, such as the Center for Biological Diversity, a large law firm that is trying to set public policy through lawsuits. And there are hundreds more listings to come. The new weapons of mass destruction, which are more deadly to the security of our nation than anything to do with any foreign country. Legislation that's being taken to the extreme, such as the Endangered Species Act. Now this act, when it was came out, was portrayed as trying to save major species from extinction. The truth is they're not species at all. They're mutations of species, variations. And increasingly, the variations being used to justify this are minute. You know, yellow spots versus red spots, or variations that can only be seen with a microscope, or even with DNA testing. Or in the case of the coho salmon in the Klamath River, well, there's no physical difference, but there's psychologically difference because, well, the fish that grow in the fish hatchery aren't the same as the ones that grow in the wild. Anything goes. We believed it has to do with extinction. And in fact, almost all of these animals are doing fine somewhere. The act is being used to make sure they're everywhere so that the listings pertain to a geographic area, a pocket. 
This is called distinct population segments. And you can tell this when you see all these adjectives. Here we're talking about a frog with the descriptor yellow-legged. It turns out that's not a species, that's a mutation. And then we see Sierra Nevada is the location. So we're talking now about a subspecies of mutation that seems to be unique to the Sierra Nevada mountains. How about this mouthful? The northern distinct population segment of the mountain yellow-legged frog. That's a proposed listing. We believed it was about animals. Turns out it has to do with bugs and grasses. The goal, we believed, was to restore the species. In fact, that does not appear anywhere in the Endangered Species Act. There is only one outcome from a listing, and that is this habitat restoration, which we've already seen is just pure destruction. It amounts to a lab, a land, and resources grab. We believe it's based upon science. We're going to talk more about this, but in fact, it's not science. Proxy data, data is not even relevant. Simulations made by a computer, garbage in, garbage out, using secret formulas, secret data sets, satellite images, anything and everything but actually going out and measuring things. This is called, quote, the best available science. We would think that it would be based upon some kind of quantitative targets. How many is too few? How many is too many? How many is enough? No such quantitative measurements exist in the Act or its implementation. We thought it had to do with native species. In fact, the Act is being applied to species that were imported, such as the Canadian gray wolf. We thought it had to do with restoring animals to where they were native in their native lands. But the fact of the matter is that's no longer a criteria. They can go ahead and designate habitat in an area where the animal or the species or the subspecies mutation was never even native, doesn't even exist. We thought they would count all the land and say, well, okay, we have enough already because we have wilderness areas and parks and national lands and so forth. We have sufficient supply there. And in fact, they exclude all the national lands. So once one species is designated and land is set aside for that species, that no longer applies to any future listings. You think that they at least consider, well, before we make this determination, let's count all the animals. And as we found out with the fish hatchery, they exclude six million salmon a year that are produced up in the Klamath Basin, saying that, well, they don't count. In fact, the Endangered Species Act can only be looked at as a hostile takeover, resulting in the abolition of property and property rights. Here's a quote from HUD Secretary Robert Weaver in the 1973 issue of American Opinion Magazine. Regional government means absolute federal control over all property and its development regardless of location anywhere in the United States to be administered on the federal officials' determination. It would supersede state and local laws. Through this authority, we seek to recapture control of the use of land. It is essentially serial plunder, one species at a time. Another act that's taken to the extreme, the Equal Access to Justice Act, which was designed to let us individuals, small litigants, sue the federal government, and if we win, get our attorney's fees back. We had to meet certain conditions. We had to be small plaintiffs, we had to win, and the legal fee recapture was $125 an hour cap. In practice, we're talking about large law firms that are getting money and being repaid under this act. They don't have to prevail in court because they just the threat in the lawsuit and then the federal government settles, called a process called sue and settle. And part of those settlements include hourly rates of $650 an hour or more for attorney fees. These settlement agreements are being kept in secret and not being made available to the public. Here's a June 26, 2013 letter from four ranking members of Natural Resources requesting to see copies of these settlement agreements. Even our congressional representatives don't know what has been agreed to. Scientific fraud, the next weapon of the mass destruction I'll talk about. And I have a number of cases that we'll be discussing. 
The spotted owl was listed in 1990-1992 to cover the forests in Northern California and Southern Oregon. It failed. The decline, according to some people, continued at about 3.5% a year. So having failed because of habitat designated, what was the proposed solution? More habitat designation. As a result, the close off of forests has been extended all the way through Oregon, up into Washington, all the way to the Canadian border. Virtually all of the Pacific coastal forests are now being shut down. In fact, it's a fraud. The spotted owls are not a species, they're a mutation. The species is not endangered or threatened. Barred owls, which are doing quite well, are the same species. And they can intermate with the spotted owls and have children. The children may not be looking exactly like spotted owls. They may be another mutation through a process of natural selection. But that's not considered to be adequate. So the solution now being proposed to save the spotted owls is to start killing and slaughtering the barred owls. This fraud is being pointed out by Dr. Bob Zyback questioning the science, pointing out the fact that computer simulations have been used versus empirical data, that there's no correlation between the owl populations and the designated habitat, and that cost the communities is in the tens of billions of dollars of economic hardships. On top of this, we now have a proposed frogs and toads listing here that will now close off the eastern forests in California along the Sierra Nevadas. This listing would take and give federal control to 2 million acres spanning 14 counties and nine forests and include the area called Yosemite. Now, in fact, there is a worldwide problem with some amphibians that appear to be dying, but we already know the reason. The primary reason is fungus that's being carried by an African clawed frog. The solution is not habitat, it's not the problem. Now, in the process of finding this listing, we've learned a few revelations. First, these frogs are dying even in pristine wilderness areas where there is no mankind whatsoever, so clearly the problem isn't related to humans. The listings, uh, their proposed habitat is not just public lands, they're now proposing to seal off private property. It doesn't matter that the Frogs and toads are not native to particular areas. They're being designated as habitat. They just say that's good habitat, therefore we'll designate it. And again, we've learned that wilderness monuments parks don't qualify. They don't count the frogs and toads that live there. This is a map of the, a map of the impact of Tuolumne County in California. The yellows, the pinks, the purples represent various areas that'll be closed off as a result of this listing. And you can see there the arrow pointing to Yosemite Valley. You can see what the impact would be on all the recreation that we've enjoyed there for decades. In terms of the Klamath River dams, which is allegedly, they want to blow these up, allegedly because the coho salmon are endangered. In fact, they're not. There's millions of them in Alaska. Salmon don't like water that's warm. And because of El Nino, the coast along the western part of the United States have warmed up a bit, so the salmon have moved north, up to Alaska, the Gulf of Alaska. They also exist over in Japan, along the Korea. They exist in the Great Lakes and other reservoirs throughout the United States where they've been successfully established. The destruction of that dam will destroy the production of 6 million salmon a year, and at least 20 million cubic yards of sediment into the river. To give some feel to that, that is one foot deep on a two-lane road for a distance of 1,600 miles. The story reached Dr. Paul Hauser, the Science Integrity Officer in the Department of Interior, who wrote a letter, quote, I submit two allegations of scientific and scholarly misconduct. Motivated by Secretary Zalasar's publicly stated 2009 intention to issue a secretarial determination in favor of removing four dams on the Klamath River, the Department of the Interior has followed a course of action to construct support for such an outcome. He was fired for writing this letter. Subsequent events are interesting. Her boss lost her job. Salazar is no longer Secretary of the Interior. 
and a satisfactory settlement was reached with Dr. Hauser in Congress. The approach being taken in all of these seems to be the ends justify the means. In terms of the Drake Bay Oyster Farm, there's a proposal to shut this farm down, which produces 40% of the oysters in California. Dr. Corey Goodman, a member of the National Academy of Science, Sciences, a well-respected venture capitalist who happens to live in the area, who has studied the, quote, science behind this, has concluded it's absolutely scientific fraud, in his own words. So one of the arguments, for example, being made against the oysters is they poop too much, therefore they have to be removed. The Park Service supporters love leaking out and claiming that, you know, that I've been paid or I'm this or I'm that. I've never been paid a penny. Everything I'm going to tell you now, I've done pro bono in my spare time. Um, and I've done it simply because I've been outraged by what I've seen my federal government do. I've been outraged by what looks to me to be a repeated pattern of intentional misrepresentation of science. Intentional, intentional misrepresentation of science. You can watch that video on the Defender Road website. 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 Now, the case of the, the case Delta Smelt the eventually the reached the courts, and Judge, and Judge Oliver, Oliver Wenger, Wenger was moved was to, say, moved to quote, say, quote, when, when, when talking, when about, talking the, about the two government, two government quote, scientists, quote, scientists there to present the, present the scientific, scientific basis for this listing, the judge says, quote, an attempt to mislead and to deceive the court. And to accept the knowledge, it was not the best science. It's not, it's science. not, it's not science. We also have we also an attack, have on, cattle. attack on cattle. Attack by attack listings, by listings of wolves, 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 predators, and predators, listings of grass, grass, sage grass, stream setbacks, setbacks overly, overly harsh, regulations. harsh regulations. And I love this. And I love this. One, this one's my favorite. One's my favorite. That the global, that the global warming, warming problem is a result, is result of cattle, cattle who fart, who fart and burp too much. There is an excellent, excellent presentation, presentation I'm going to give a very, very quick synopsis, synopsis, synopsis that Alan Saber, Alan Saber gave, gave on, TED Talks, on TED Talks about his about research, his research on, this issue on this issue in Africa. In Africa. What he points what to he points is desertification in these grass and areas, 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 areas that here across, the, here across globe. the globe, where there is where water, water present, 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 but it doesn't seem, it doesn't to, stay seem to stay in the soil. And as a result, the soil is becoming, turning into desert. And he indicates in the case that there's, there's a sort of a case in the U.S. National, US National Parks, 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 just as bad just as, as, bad as, as you see it in Africa. The problem is the this. We have grasses, have grasses that, grow, that grow. And kind of like, like, like our forest, something has something to happen, happen with that material. With that material. It must biologically decay or be removed in some fashion so that there's room for the next year's growth. Fire is, fire not, is not a good option because, because it generates, it generates more, emissions more emissions and more emissions and harming, 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 emissions. harming emissions. And his statement, his statement one, hectare one hectare equals 6,000 6, cars. cars. The solution, the solution he found is he found out was to go ahead and use, ahead cattle, and use cattle, cattle, bunched, bunched and herds like, herd like, like in the wild. In the wild. And the result, and the result is, is cattle act kind of like, like, nature's, like farmers. nature's farmers. They till the soil, they fertilize it, and they harvest the crop. All of which all makes, which for, makes a good for a growing season, growing season and next year, next year because, because the ground is in condition, condition, condition to accept the water, accept the water and there's room, and there's for, the room for new growth. Now he supplied, now he supplied this, this to areas that areas look, like look, this. look like this in Africa. In Africa. And he's done this, and he's done this over millions, over millions of hectares, so there's so no so question no about this working. And this is the result. They didn't, come, they to didn't come to this easily because, because initially, because initially they, tried they tried experiments by removing human beings. beings. That didn't work. That didn't work. They tried removing something else. That didn't work. They removed cattle and all that. That didn't work. Cattle, 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 that that didn't work. And eventually and they eventually concluded they concluded they the habitat, habitat was being destroyed, destroyed, and destroyed and they sort of caused by elephants. They slaughtered 40,000 elephants. Who would have believed that scientists would kill more elephants than poachers? Nonetheless, the desertification continued. It was only, it was by, only the by the reintroduction of cattle, of cattle that they actually, that they were, actually able were able to get the habitat come back. Come back. And there's more, and examples. there's more examples. Another aspect, Another aspect of scientific, scientific fraud, fraud is the pending, and pending and very dire, very dire consequence, consequence of proposed listing for the sage, grouse. sage grouse. According to According Professor, to Professor Emeritus, Emeritus J. J. Wayne, Wayne Burkhart, Burkhart, the University, University of Nevada, who's actually taken actual measurements of this for more than 30 years, the main threat to sage grass, grass is about humans or humans serpents, 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 but instead, but instead cheat, grass cheat grass and wildfires. And wildfires. 
and third, and third most entrance most entrance threat, threat is predators, 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 predators namely ravens, coyotes, 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 and badgers. Habitat, habitat human, intervention, human intervention, and human activity, human activity has nothing, has to, nothing do to do with it. Governance, Governance central, planning, central planning, I'll talk about, I'll talk about and what I'll and call what I'll agency, 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 I think everybody's, I think everybody's already, already familiar, familiar with. with. And I find the and word, find agency, the word agency, agency interesting, interesting because who are they the, who are they the agents of? Because it's certainly, it's not, certainly not our agents. Our they're, agents. Not, they're not obviously been obviously formed, been formed protect to protect us. us. They've been formed, They've been formed to control us. us. And this idea and this of an idea introduction, of introduction process, process is completely outside, completely outside the, Constitution. the Constitution. We now have, we now administrative, have administrative, not constitutional law, law administrative, administrative, not constitutional, constitutional courts, and decisions, and decisions by administrators, by administrators not, jurors. not jurors. So what are so we, what to, are do we to do about it? First, we, First, have, to we have to start by admitting, admitting it. We are, we are losing. We are losing. We are losing. And we're not going to win by repeating, by repeating what we've been doing, doing for the past, past several decades. decades. And one of those one things, of those that, things we've that we've been, been doing, doing is looking, is looking Washington, to Washington, D.C. for solutions, solutions or for hatreds. hatreds. That hasn't, that hasn't worked, worked for us well. too well. The only, the only solution, solution is that people, people must, lead. must lead. They need to they get, need off, get the off the bleachers and onto the field. field. I use the I use analogy, analogy of a football, football game. game. I think most, I think most of us feel that we're going to elect a sheriff or elect a few county supervisors or commissioners, and they're going to do all the work for us. And we're going to sit in the bleachers, bleachers and eat our popcorn, popcorn and drink, and drink our, soda our soda drinks. drinks. Well, how well, well how is that, that working for us? It isn't. It isn't. The fact the of fact the matter, matter is the opposition, is, the opposition is, very is very well funded. funded. It's a it's very, very well, well controlled, controlled um, um, force, force top-down top down direction. Down direction. We need, we need to get, get off the bleachers, the bleachers and onto the, onto field, the field and take and personal, personal responsibility, responsibility for making things happen. Defend rural America. Is an all volunteer movement. movement. There's no, There's money, no in money in this organization. organization. It's not it's even not an organization. organization. It's just a voluntary, voluntary participation, participation of individuals, individuals and organizations. organizations. We have adopted, we have adopted the, ideas the ideas that have been set forth. forth. There's a complete, There's a complete package, package here. here. Education, strategy, strategy tactics, tactics training, training, and organizing. And organizing. Defend Rural America, America is organized, is organized by, by county. county. It's nonpartisan. It's non-partisan. It, believes it believes in prioritization. Believes in believes focus, focus. It believes, believes in going, in going on, the on the offense. Current efforts include the constitutional county, restoring local government, taking neo-environmentalism head on, and immediately reopening the forest and start responsible management. It was launched on October 22, 2011 in Wairika, California, at an event that I helped coordinate, and included a panel of sheriffs has become famous under the video called Sheriff Stand Tall for the Constitution, including Sheriff John Lopey, who was standing there at the mic, and I am behind him and somewhat to the left behind the camera there at the edge of the shot. You can see me there. This is the website, Defend Rural America. is a tremendous and free resource. It's free. You don't have no charge for it. It's free of advertising. It's free of Google because I don't use Google Alerts. Therefore, your clicks are not being recorded by Google or analyzed. It's completely free access. Take advantage of it. It's organized in the following way. The left-hand panel is the contents and has the links to the different pages. The center takes on a particular topic and discusses it. And the right-hand panel has more details and links as appropriate for the particular topic. Here are some of those topics. Now that was just kind of a brief shot through a few of the pages on their website. There's probably two to three times this many pages. Not a whole lot of pages, but every single one of them is meaningful and covers a particularly relevant topic to rural America. This one on jurisdiction, I highly encourage people to go to. At the top, there's a link called the Jurisdiction White Paper. You can click on that, pull it down and read it, as well as a video immediately below that. You can watch it and have others watch and see that. We're going to be talking more about jurisdiction later today. And also the Apache County story, which is the role model for how counties can go ahead and begin to take control of their lands and begin remanaging them at a local level. This is a two and a half hour video of Doyle making a presentation to defend rural America event here in California. Highly recommended. 
So the strategies consist of two parts. Just like football, you have to have a defense. And what we have to defend ourselves against is that coming onslaught of even more endangered species listings. There is no choice. We must engage and we must be effective in the way that we do it. First, we have to change public opinion. Expose what the endangered species has really become. Second, we have to immediately engage any current listings. If they're in the comment period, you must mobilize to make comments. And third, we need to create and finance a permanent shield. Now this is gonna be a short executive summary of a six hour presentation being made by Doyle Shamley in California where I had him out there to train 30 people in California to write effective commentary on endangered species listings. The goal here is to defeat these listings before they even become rules, therefore without going to court and, the, and all the enormous costs and time that go along with that. So how do we do that? First is to understand the National Environmental Policy Act. It's a procedural requirement. It requires public participation. It does not place the environment above all, and it has two parts. It has the intent of Congress and it establishes a Council on Environmental Quality, which then establishes the regulations under which this law will be enacted or enforced. And then other agencies then adopt those to their purposes. The process is a legal process, and engaging in this process and writing commentary, we have to treat it as if we're preparing for court. We have to have a full history of all the documentation. We have to make, be able to prove that we submitted commentary and so forth. And the commentary has to be meaningful. So treat it as lawsuit preparation. And if the counties and the states do not engage, then your people have no standing in court unless they have individually done this. You essentially have allowed your constituents to be unrepresented in these listings. There is a process that this goes through, and I won't go through all these steps in here. I'm not gonna cover all the details, but just understand that there's a legally required process to go through, and part of that process includes a comment period. Now, NEPA documents also have a certain structure. This is where the environmental impact statement, for example, is presented, it talks about the alternatives and the impacts, and goes through analysis, and then makes some recommendations. Now, in terms of writing commentary to fight these listings, the first decision is to decide which way we're going to go. And the basis for making that decision is the no action alternative. That is the baseline from which the whole environmental impact statement is written. That is the one that says this is where things are today. Now, if the no action baseline is everything we want, then our goal here is to use the comments to get get the proponents of the listing to give up their proposal and fall back to ours, the no action alternative. If on the other hand, what we want is outside the scope, then we have to force them to abandon the draft environmental impact statement as it is written. Now, who can submit commentary? It turns out anyone or any entity can submit commentary from anywhere. You don't have to be local to the area. You don't even have to live in the state. In fact, you don't even have to live in the United States. <laughs> How about that? You get a vote no matter where you are anywhere in the world. And if you want, you can do it anonymously. And you can do it any number of times. Now, there's different kinds of effect the commentary has. And I'm going to call them non-substantive and substantive. Non-substantive is where we're expressing opinions or feelings um, we're talking about things that are outside the scope of the environmental impact statement, therefore it's irrelevant, or things that have been previously decided and so forth. They would just be ignored because the only response will be is to the substantive comments. And some people feel, therefore, these aren't worth doing. On the other hand, I see them being used all the time by many of these neo-environmental groups saying, well, the public wants this, and they're quoting these statistics. And those statistics are counts of the different kinds of commentary support that's been submitted in support. Therefore, I think it's worthwhile engaging. 
And in California, the Frogs and Toads listing, I wrote a form commentary. I sent it out to my list and had people go ahead and submit it. And I highly encourage everyone to do the same thing. This is a screenshot from the page, and you can see there's a list of the most recent um, submissions. And you'll see at the top, and I put this in all capital letters, and I encourage everybody to do that, make sure that the very first words express how you feel about it, I do not support. And then it goes on and say, the US FWS proposal to list as endangered species, the frogs and toads. Next one, I do not support, I do not support. Anybody that went to that page can see that the public is against this. Now, there's usually not a whole lot of comments on listings. Up in Oregon, for example, they now have a, frog, a spotted frog. They've gone from spotted owls to spotted frogs. Proposed listing, and so far, the last time I looked, only had six comments. Defend Rural America took this on as an issue. We raised the flag. We had emergency meetings. We got congressmen involved. We got 14 county commissioner, counties involved. And the last time I looked, we had 19,906 comments received on this proposed listing and 21,382 on the proposed designated habitat. A huge win for us. Therefore, I believe the non-sustaining commentary is useful in terms of shaping public opinion. Now, substantive commentary is that which the agency will respond to, and there's only one criteria. They will respond to it if they know that they will lose in appeal or litigation unless they respond to the issue that's been raised. That's it. And it turns out there's two types of comment. One is to address the content. You challenge, for example, the science, or you challenge the conclusions, or whatever. You're talking about the the actual details of the proposal. The other is actually to challenge the process by which they're moving forward. And as it turns out, all successful appeals are based upon process errors. Therefore, our job is to move content to process. Or as showed here, we take the things in the content that are objectionable, but we explain them how they are violations of the NEPA process. Our goal here then is, through this process, to get an accurate professional CEQA compliant analysis, get the accurate information in, the misleading information out, and find the process errors that create legal problems, and then tell them how to fix the document. Because at the end of the day, they're going to produce a document. Our goal is to make sure that document is accurate. Now, these are violations of the law that technically will make uh, the agency lose in court. For example, if the decision is arbitrary, capricious, or an abuse of discretion, contrary to constitutional right, power, privilege, or immunity, and so forth. And here are some examples of those violations that we can point out, and I'm gonna focus on three. Bias, a predetermined outcome. Under NEPA, this is supposed to be an absolutely neutral document. It's not supposed to represent or move towards a predetermined outcome. And part of that is the alternatives cannot be excessively narrow. In other words, they can't just say alternatives and all of them favor their approach. They have to be genuine, realistic alternatives, including the no-action alternative. At the bottom, I've added to Dell's list one more thing called lack of jurisdiction. Here is a commentary that I filed on frogs and toads and I challenge the jurisdiction of the agency to do the listing at all. And I'll read the first paragraph. The United States Fish and, Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife Service has not established it has an ownership interest in exclusive, concurrent, partial, or proprietary legislative authority over, jurisdiction over, the lands proposed as critical habitat. And accordingly, the jurisdiction is challenged. Once challenged, jurisdiction cannot be assumed. It must be proven. Lack of response is an admission of the lack of jurisdiction. I then lay out the actions that need to take, which involves putting another section into their proposed rule, and I tell them things that I want included, which turns out to be a whole slug of Supreme Court decisions and others that favor the argument 
that they don't have jurisdiction. I believe this is a model that every single person, organization, government agency should be using going forward is to always challenge the jurisdiction of these listings. The information sources upon which one can draw upon to prepare a good commentary includes the Federal Register, which is where the notices go out. Somebody has to monitor that every day for every county to make sure that there's something, if it's come up, that there's an immediate response and action follow-up plan, Freedom of Information Act requests, prior court decisions, citations. In the case of frogs and toads, the proposed rule had 300 different documents, other documents that were cited in support of that document. You have to go out there and study them all, as well as do your own internet searches. So kind of finishing up that overview, that quick executive overview of Doyle's presentation. Having done this as a volunteer and have people do this in a volunteer effort, the bottom line is a, it is a long and tedious and time-consuming process that takes people of certain skills and certain ability to understand and be able to put things down in a logical way and to write. The counties have to engage. They have to put together this permanent shield and they have to pay for it. And I recommend they do this by hiring an expert consultant to monitor the Federal Register and respond appropriately in coordination with the commissioners and the supervisors. Participate in training. I propose that the counties coordinate across multiple counties and share the costs. When you do that, the cost is relatively minimal compared to the normal budgets. And that we can work together nationally on submitting. There's no reason that people in Montana can't write commentary about frogs and, co and toes in California. And likewise, we in here in California can't write commentary about wolves and sage grouse and buffalo in Montana or Idaho or Wyoming. Now, the second part of this is having an offense. You can't win unless you have an offense. I mean, you can have a defense team that's the best thing in the world, but you're never going to score. And eventually, your opposition is going to push you down the field, push you down the field, and they're going to score. So you have to have an offense. And that offense is to understand and use your full jurisdiction, which is now our topic. The particular proposal that we laid in front of counties here in California, and we're laying in front of counties in Montana and elsewhere, are two resolutions following the Apache County success story. One, declare a state of emergency. Acknowledge to the world that the county is, having, is going to go down, bottom line. You know, something has to be done. And resolution two is then to take action. In this case, it was to authorize and direct the sheriff to reopen forest roads and to begin proper forest management. Starting with the pilot program where you can make all your mistakes, learn on it, make that work, and do all this under the county's authority and obligation to defend the health, safety, and welfare of its people. Now, here's kind of the roadmap for, I think, discussing jurisdiction. First question is, what authority do the states and the counties have? And there's kind of a basic level of understanding of this, and then there's a more advanced level of understanding this that involves the Constitution and so forth. Once you understand that the states and the counties have far more jurisdiction than we understood, then your next level of question is going to be, well, wait a minute, then what real jurisdiction does the federal government have? We will not be addressing that here today because that's not part of the proposal. We're not proposing to remove the federal government from the land management process. In fact, what we're talking about is a cooperative approach to working together to basically force them to do what they should have been doing all along, which is coordinating with the people in the counties on these programs. So let's start now with the basic one. I'm going to talk about two things, health, safety, and welfare in the 1962 Eisenhower Report, both of which support county-level action. First, states and counties have the authority and the duty to defend the health, safety, and welfare of the constituents, and none other. That's their job. And it includes problems that attack the health, safety, and welfare, even if it involves the so-called, quote, national forests. Within any state of this union, the preservation of the peace and the protection of persons and property are the function of the state government and are not part of the primary duty, at least, of the nation. 
all persons are born free and have certain inalienable rights. Now, this comes from the Montana Constitution. They include the right to a clean and healthful environment. I would suggest that currently the Montana legislature and the commissioners have not met their own constitutional requirement. And the rights of pursuing life's basic necessities, enjoying and defending their lives and liberties, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and seeking their safety, health, and happiness in all lawful ways. California's Constitution also gives support for local jurisdiction. All people are by nature free and independent and have inalienable rights. Among these are enjoying and defending life and liberty, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and pursuing and obtaining safeness, happiness, and privacy. A person may not be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law or denied equal protection of the laws. It is not the job of the state or the county governments to enforce federal legislation. It is not their job to protect the birds and bees. And it is not their job to represent the interests of anyone but their constituents. And here in a tremendous Supreme Court decision, Prince versus United States in 1997, which by the way was Ravalli County, Montana, and congratulations to Ravalli County, a decision that states in no uncertain terms that the federal government cannot dictate to the states. We held in New York that Congress cannot compel the states to enact or enforce a federal regulatory program. Today we hold that Congress cannot circumvent that prohibition by constricting the state's officers directly. The federal government may neither issue nor directories requiring the states to address particular problems nor command the state's officers or those of their political subdivisions to administer or enforce a federal regulatory program. Such commands are fundamentally incompatible with our constitutional system of dual sovereignty. Next, the 1962 Eisenhower Report. Now, this was passed long after the Enabling Acts for most states, so it already encompasses whatever those acts had in them. It categorizes all quote-unquote federal land interest in the five categories. They're based upon the amount of jurisdiction. Category one is exclusively federal. Category two is kind of a mix. Category three is a mix. And then here's category four called preparatory interest only. In category four, quote, the federal government has acquired some right or title to an area in a state, but has not obtained any measure of the state's authority over the area. Not obtain any measure of the state's authority over the area. In other words, the state retains exclusive legislative authority and jurisdiction. Turns out 95% of those two-thirds of the western states that we have been calling federal lands fall into Category 4. Or put it another way, these maps are all wrong. That is not federal land or federally controlled land. It is under state legislative authority. Those maps are misleading, and we should stop using them. Now we kind of moved on to some advanced discussion of this jurisdiction question. And this is more than you need to actually have the counties move forward. I want to make that clear, but this is just more information for you to understand. We're going to start by talking about jurisdiction of public lands. And before we do so, we have to differentiate because there's a lot of confusion in people when they talk about this issue. So you've got to understand there's different things we're talking about. Who owns land? A trustee relationship over land. Legislative authority over land or jurisdiction. The word jurisdiction is not commonly used correctly. The word juris, just like jurisprudence, refers to the courts. The Constitution has a remarkably short section on the courts. And so the courts had to decide what is their authority, and they logically concluded that their authority extends to the legislative authority in Article I of the Constitution. In other words, court authority or jurisdiction follows legislative authority. Who owns the public lands? The answer, the people. That's why they're called public lands. We, the people. 
In the United States, sovereignty resides in the people. Sovereignty resides in the people. It is the sovereigns that own land. Now, why was this? Because the, the whole story of the United States government is the end centuries and centuries of control by kings and others, largely through their process of feudalism, whereby they claimed ownership of the lands and built a pyramid of power, including governors and lords and so forth, all of which were there to make people the serfs. The American experiment is to end feudalism under the idea that all land then belongs to the people, not to the king, either as public land under collective ownership or private property as individual ownership. And the goal was to move public land into private property. And this was because they recognized that a free hold is required to be a free man. Anything that reverses this process, that moves private property or even, quote, public property back into some kind of a state-controlled point or state ownership is a reversal of this process. It's essentially extinguishing private property, which is, of course, Marxism. The Communist Manifesto is summarized by Karl Marx in his own words. The theory of communism may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. He recognized that in order to control people, they could not have the means of production. Therefore, you had to take control of the means of production away from them. Now, then there's a trustee relationship of a land. Who's the trustee? The federal government. That is the role that they have. The United States never held any municipal sovereignty, jurisdiction, or right of soil in and to the territory of which Alabama or any of the new states were formed except for temporary purposes and to execute the trusts created. Next, we deal with the question of legislative authority, which is defined by the Constitution. What's the full name of the Constitution? Constitution of the United States of America, correct? Wrong. It is the Constitution for the United States of America an important difference will be discussed in a future session. The Constitution is a declaration. It is not a two-party contract. It did not require approval from government officials that were not even in place at that point in time. It was simply a declaration by the people of the type of government we would be governed by. We did this as the sovereigns. It establishes one nation. Is that true? No. It establishes one federation. The importance of this is that when we believe that we are a single nation, then we therefore accept the idea of some kind of a supreme and central government in court. And in fact, that is not true either. What it did do is establish a federation of states, a voluntary union of sovereign states and nations to work together on a limited, enumerated purposes. The states are sovereign countries, but they are acting like counties, and that's part of the problem. For example, we say governor, but governor is a term that comes from feudalism, talking about an individual who manages a certain portion of the land on behalf of the king. I think a more appropriate name would be the president, say the president of Montana. And the United States are versus the United States is, singular. It establishes a permanent Congress, a place essentially to meet and to work things out of common interest, and it contains an organization chart with job descriptions. It delegates. It does not grant. It does not give away authority. It just lends them to our representatives who are supposed to represent our interests. Article 1 is the very first one that defines the legislative, and it's important because it established the powers and the limitations. It is the legislative power of the federal government that breathes life into the rest of it, and the Bill of Rights affirms those limitations. Article 2 established an executive to execute the legislation, not issue executive orders, and Article 3 established a judiciary to constitutionally resolve disputes, not make the law. 
Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the Constitution is perhaps one of the most important because of the way it has been abused. It reads, the Congress shall have power to exercise exclusive legislation. And that's an important word that we'll be talking about later on. In all cases whatsoever, over such district, not exceeding 10 square miles, as may be, as may by concession of particular states and the acceptance of Congress, become the seat of the government of the United States. In other words, it has exclusive legislative authority over Washington, D.C., and to exercise like authority of what's called the federal enclaves, places as purchased by the consent of the legislator of the state in which they shall be for enumerated purposes, for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. That's it. Now, in Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2, it reads, The Congress shall have power to dispose of. What that means is convert public domain into private property and make all need for rules and regulations. That's not the same as legislation. Respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. States are no longer territory or belongings. And nothing in this Constitution shall be so construed as to prejudice any claims of the United States or of any particular state. If we take a look at this pictorially, we see a federal zone, certain land over which the government exercises exclusive legislative authority. That is Washington, D.C., the federal enclaves, and the possessions. The territories have all been converted to the states on equal footing and no longer apply. That's where the exclusive legislative authority lies. Any law that relates within a government, created, passed by a government relating to its operation, is called municipal law, as versus international law or I will call this in the case of laws passed by the federal government on behalf of the people at large, I will call that general law. We therefore have two types of law, municipal law, general law, both being passed by the same Congress. And this word municipal sovereignty appears in this particular rule. The United States never held any municipal sovereignty, jurisdiction, or right of soil in and to the territory, except for temporary purposes and to execute the trust created. Legislation is presumptively territorial and can find the limits over which the lawmaking power has jurisdiction. Legislation of Congress, unless a contrary intent appears, is meant to apply only within the territorial jurisdiction of the United States, in other words, the federal zone. All legislation is prima facie territorial. Within any state of this union, the preservation of the peace and the protection of person and property are the functions of the state government and are not part of the primary duty, at least, of the nation. In other words, it's the state's role, not the federal government. The laws of Congress in respect to those matters do not extend into the territorial limits of the states but have force only within the federal zone. Therefore, the legislative authority belongs to the states. And this is why the Eisenhower Report affirms that position. And jurisdiction follows legislative. In other words, where the federal government does not have legislative authority, their courts are not the proper courts to resolve the issues. The jurisdiction belongs to the states. Now, if this has not resolved the matter in the opinion of some people's minds, <clears throat> we have this debate. Those who would like to suggest that the federal government owns these public lands. In order to establish that federal ownership, I say prove it, and I believe that's the proper position for the states to take. First off, show us the title, show us the deeds. And you must establish how you acquired those lands. By the state enabling acts? No. Here's a state enabling act that brought into existence Montana, North and South Dakota, and Washington. 
The people inhabiting said proposed states do agree and declare that they forever disclaim all right and title to the unappropriated public lands lying within the boundaries thereof. This is not a grant of title to the federal government. It is essentially saying is we're not changing the title. It leaves whatever the title status is unchanged. It is not a grant of land. Well then, if it was not acquired by the enabling acts, then well, by state grant. Either the states granted the land to the federal government or they sold it to the federal government. Or the state authorized the sale of those lands to the federal government. But they have no title. How can they do that? And they have no authority to designate the sale of the people's land to some other entity. In the United States, sovereignty resides in the people who act through the organs established by the Constitution. The Congress cannot invoke the sovereign power of the people to override their will, as thus declared. Where rights are skirt by the Constitution are involved, there can be no rulemaking or legislation which would abrogate them. Where Congress exceeds its authority relative to the states, the departure from the constitutional plan cannot be ratified by the consent of state officials. The constitutional authority of Congress cannot be expanded by the consent of the governmental unit whose domain is thereby narrowed, whether that unit is the executive branch or the states. And more simply, the states cannot diminish the rights of the people. Well, perhaps then the federal government bought them from private individuals, but they have no authority to do so. We've already gone through the Constitution, and nowhere in there does it allow the federal government to begin to take back control of the people's public lands. Well, what's left? That they acquired it by treaty. But no, the people are the sovereigns, and the treaties are on behalf of the people of this country as the sovereigns that did not give the title to the land to the federal government. Now, returning to that Enabling Act, the next phrase in that act says, and that until the title thereto shall have been extinguished by the United States, the same shall be and remain subject to the disposition of the United States. Now, what does the United States mean? In 1856, Bouvier's Law Dictionary contained this definition, which I think we would recognize. The United States is the name of this country. The United States, now 31 in number, are, not is, are, and then then proceeds to go ahead and name those states. In other words, the United States is a union. It is a federation. And here are all the treaties that came into existence. And notice that the final treaty that led to statehood was in 1854, two years before the definition of the United States that I just read to you. By those definitions and standards, one can only interpret that any lands that came in by treaty came in on behalf of the United States, plural, the people of those states. If one were to continue the argument, well, the federal government owns these lands, you would also have to establish that ownership provides legislative authority. And that legislative authority is exclusive legislative authority. And that legislative authority that's exclusive is not subject to the Constitution. It also creates federal sovereignty, and that federal sovereignty trumps sovereignty of the people. And you'd have to disprove the Eisenhower Report and other federal documents. Well, and there's another argument, debate, well, the federal government has the legislative authority. Well, let's consider that argument. I say once again, prove it. Because in order to prove it, you have to prove the following. The Article 1, Section 8, Paragraph 17 does not apply. That those restrictions are not restrictions. Or you'd have to argue that Article 4, Section 3, which is rules and regulations over territories and possessions, that the state public lands are still territories or federal possessions, that rules and regulations equal legislative authority, legislative authority equals exclusive legislative authority, and once again, not subject to the Constitution, and it creates a federal sovereignty and trumps the sovereignty of the people. 
And again, you'd have to negate the Eisenhower report and other federal documents. I think it's appropriate for state legislators considered legislation that requires the federal government to prove it. To prove they have ownership or that they have legislative authority or they have jurisdiction or that exclusive legislative authority is the same as being above the Constitution, equivalent to sovereignty of a federal entity, and trumps the sovereignty of the people. I believe the federal government would have a very difficult to impossible time to prove that. But I believe this is a, a decent request for the state legislatures to now consider. Now let's consider for a moment jurisdiction over private property. We turn to our model, the plan was to convert public lands to private property. This was accomplished through land patents, documents that are issued to convey title. All private property in the United States is connected to a land patent. This includes farms, ranchers, and so forth, ranches and so forth, as well as homes. Here's a sample land patent. This one was signed by President William McKinley in 1901. And the critical language is this. Know ye that there is therefore granted the tract of land with the appurtenance thereof unto the said person and to his heirs and assigns forever. Granted forever. Forever means forever. This is consistent with the idea that we were not going to be a nation based upon feudalism, but the land would be belonging to the people, the sovereigns, and could not be reclaimed by a government and turned back into more of a monarchy or feudalist system. Now, federal land acquisitions, as I said, are the equivalent to extinguishing private property following a Marxist philosophy. No, that's not constitutional. A terrific interview that could be watched uh, on the issue of land patents is one that I conducted with Ron Gibson. How they recommend that you listen to that interview. It's available on the Defend Rural America website. So if you take a look at private property, the states cleared title, thus they're not in the chain of title. The federal government granted title forever. And the people are sovereign unto whom all land belongs except for the federal enclaves then the question is, do either the state or federal governments have the right of eminent domain? Or does that, in fact, reside with the people? What we've been watching is a revolution that's occurring, an unlimited expansion of the federal zone in the name of environmentalism, under the theory that wherever the air blows, the water flows, the grass grows, the animals roam, is federal jurisdiction. This essentially is equivalent to an overthrow of the whole philosophy our country was based upon, government by the consent of the governed. It is an overthrow of the Constitution and the ideas of constitutional government, that is, government serves the people. All in the name of frogs and toads, there's one other country that has a philosophy of reversing private property into common property, state property. I believe we've had the revolution and now we need to have the restoration to peel this back to the constitutional moorings that this country was founded on. Going forward, I encourage everyone, every group, every association, every government entity the challenge jurisdiction and standing is a matter of course. Everything, every listing, every rule and regulation, every federal court case. Once challenged, jurisdiction cannot be assumed. It must be proved to exist. Jurisdiction, once challenged, cannot be assumed and must be decided. We need to regain our voice. Now we have I propose that we have a unified strategy in doing so. Here are the various ideas about how to reclaim our control over our lands. And I'll divide them into two buckets. In column A, we have statehood, the idea of separation, some call 
wrongly call secession, coordination, or fixing the problem with federal legislation. In column B, we have jurisdiction. What ties all of those in common A together is they all require federal approval. If the federal government does not approve or does not consent or go along with it, those plans go nowhere. Unique among these approaches is jurisdiction, because if the jurisdiction is as I say, the jurisdiction resides with the states and the counties, we really have 80 to 90 percent of the solution that we're looking for, and we can execute it immediately. So given these four approaches, my recommendation is that the leaders of all four of these must take a look at jurisdiction first and foremost, understand these arguments and what is behind them, incorporate that in their thinking, and I believe that once they understand fully jurisdiction, they'll reach the same conclusion that I did, that really jurisdiction solves most of what we're trying to do. So what's holding us back? Our view of the people who are at the top, we're the sovereigns. And at the county, we send our property taxes to the county and we use our votes to control the county. And the county does what government's supposed to do. It does two things, sets policy and enforces that policy. That's what we call government. The reality is more like this. The people have been pushed to the bottom and there's the county and what happens is the county property taxes no longer stay in the county. They can now go to the states. They bypass the county. Now, the state's all too willing to give you money back, provided you go along with their particular programs. They'll give you grants for specific programs, which makes the grant right one of the most important people in the county. Essentially, what this means is that policy has been taken away from the people and the local government. The policy now comes with the money, and the county just becomes a mere enforcer of the policy. And the perfect enablement of that is actually to create regional plans that embody those top down policies in a way that they're built right into the zoning laws. Now, this is such a good deal that the states aren't the only one. In fact, this started with the federal government, the idea that the 16th Amendment created a federal income tax, which bypassed the counties, bypassed the states, empowered the federal government, and the federal government then gave the money back on conditions, with strings attached. The United Nations also using this, for those of you who understand Agenda 21, this is where that fits. Regionalism or regional planning, this whole idea of stakeholders, people that are not constituents, people that can live anywhere and have a voice in your local decision making. This is also where campaign finances fit in, money that's coming from outside influencing our elected officials, as well as the unions that represent elected individuals, putting the elected representatives now in a position of having two bosses, those that vote for them and those that control their financial situation, the unions, Service Employee International Union being one. This is the word governance, the separation of policy and enforcement. That's why the people aren't being listened to. The dollars are outweighing your votes and your interests. All of those are forms essentially one thing, central planning. Behind all this are the international bankers. This is a topic in its own right. I won't go any further in exploring that in this presentation. They gained much of their power in the 1913 revolution, which includes the alleged ratification of the 16th Amendment, the alleged ratification of the 17th Amendment, and the alleged passing of the Federal Reserve Act. It gave them the banking and the taxation to fund all this. And all the central planning bodies are known as Soviets. That's where the name Soviet Union comes from. The reality is in this process, that the state and the federal government are stealing the money from the local government, and then they're returning with bribes. They'll give you money by bribing you. And in the process, they are giving themselves an unconstitutional expansion of authority. In participating in this, accepting the money, accepting the policies, the county officials and the state officials at whatever level you want to view this, when we elect them, they're called representatives for a reason. 
They are our agents, and agency law has a lot of teeth, as any broker or realtor would tell you. When you don't represent the interest of the person you're supposed to, you're a breach of fiduciary duty, conflict of interest, self-dealing, negligence. When you participate in this unconstitutional power of authority, you're, develop, you're participating in an illegal transfer of authority and a conspiracy to oppress. And one part of the fighting back is what I call constitutional counties, part of which is the restoration of local government, because if we don't, then we're going to suffer global governance. We need to elect constitutional representatives. I'm talking about sheriffs, supervisors or commissioners, district attorneys, county councils, judges, state legislators, obviously. We need patriots, not administrators. What you can do. First, you can support the Defend Rural America effort. For the first time, there is a real opportunity to unite. From the time that this started it up in Northern California, it expanded through major parts of the rural counties in California all the way down through Fresno. It's expanding further south now. We started it in Oregon, and we're here today talking about it in Montana. There's been a slug of recent events to go ahead and present this information to a wide number of people, county, county commissioners, in order to get this moving at the same time across a broad area. And that included some training on the East of Defense that we hosted uh, Doyle Shanley to provide. We asked for the counties to pass these three resolutions. First, declare a state of emergency. I mean, let's openly acknowledge to ourselves, to our constituents, to everybody that our counties are failing and they're going to go down. They are in a state of emergency. They, they are imploding. Resolution two is to authorize and direct the local forest management to begin again. And three is to put in place a permanent ease of defense. If this is done across multiple willing counties and the cost can be shared, the cost is relatively minor. At the state level, the state can affirm the Constitution and its actual intent. It can affirm state jurisdiction. It can affirm local county jurisdiction. And it can provide a slate of restorative legislation. It is, at the end of the day, your county or your state, your future, your battle, and your decision. My promise is that if you support Defend Rural America, I will support you. Thank you for your time.